Right, hello. Good to welcome you back to another episode of Idea Space with the Urban Design Group, Urban Naus, and me, Christopher Martin. I'm an urban designer and planner, focusing on the design of public realm and streets, co-founder and director of Urban Strategy at Urban Movement, and I'm on the executive committee of the Urban Design Group. I'm trying to explore the full range of issues that influence the design of cities and shape society with this series, so we can sharpen our focus and create more enjoyable places. And for this episode, we're going to be focusing on quality of life. Moving forward next year and for the next few years to come, I believe quality of life will increasingly be the battleground for which cities compete for visitors, residents, businesses, investment and success. So increasingly, this is something that which every city will need to be working towards and focusing on in all that they do. So I'm thrilled to be joined by Maria Vasilaku to talk about implementing fast urban change with local people to improve quality of life. Maria served as Vice Mayor for Vienna, um, as well as Executive Councillor for Urban Planning, Traffic and Transport, Climate Protection, Energy Planning and Public Participation, where she oversaw highly ambitious programmes that reimagined the city and made it into one of the leading cities in Europe today in terms of quality of life. She's also founder of Vienna Solutions, where she applies these lessons around the world. Maria, great to have you with us. Hello, hello, Chris. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting uh, and thanks for your kind introduction. Now, I would like to share the story of Vienna and to be precise how we planned and managed the major urban transitions um, that, as a matter of fact, did not support us in becoming the world's number one in terms of livability, but actually helped us remain the world's number one in terms of livability for a decade up to date. Now, Vienna is an extremely international city. It's located at the heart of Central Europe, and you may have heard several times up to now that it has been ranked regularly as the world's most livable city. Um, well, for 10 consecutive years in a row, uh, ever since the year 2010, according to MERSA, and uh, in the past two years, also according to the well-known economist ranking. Now, the city is rapidly growing, and uh, it has been rapidly growing for two decades now. It grows by approximately 25,000 per year, um, which is, of course, wonderful. Um, and I think that what happened already back then in the early 90s was that the city realized how important redesigning public space is for a growing city. So the city actually embarked in a number of wonderful projects offsetting our heritage and at the same time actually upgrading public space. And the one that you see here is one that I'm extremely proud of. It was finalized before I became vice mayor, so I have nothing to do with it. And it proves that the city was already on a very, very good way uh, already once again since the mid 90s. One second asset of Vienna that is most probably one of the main reasons why we became the world's most livable city is public housing. Uh, there's a tradition of 100 years of public housing. What you can here see is, an, is a historical building that is uh, almost 100 years old. Um, and this is what subsidized so-called social housing looks like today. So... As a matter of fact, in the meantime, 62% of all Viennese live either in public housing units or in subsidized units, paying thus highly affordable rents. Uh, this is unique all over the world. And at the same time, enjoying really incredible housing quality. Now, the city is also one that has invested um, already in the 60s and 70s in high-level public transport. Um, just to give you one example, it is a city that decided to keep the tram, although it started building a metro line, uh, well, the first metro lines, uh, already back in the, in the 70s. And it is thus why it has one of the most dense public transport networks that there are worldwide for a city this size. So this was already there as well when the city became the world's number one and is also crucial to that. But then since we will be talking a lot about livability, I would like to make it more clear what I'm talking about. So what is life quality? I say 
Life quality is living in a place where you live because you want to and not because you have to. It's a place where you can enjoy life. It's a place where you can afford to enjoy life. Everybody, as a matter of fact, can afford a good life. And it's a place that's good for children. If cities are not like this, they may tend to look like that. Um, because this is the result of cities that are not livable and are not affordable. In the end, you have young couples feeling like either they have to move to somewhere in the suburbs because they can't afford a flat in the city or they have to move there because they want their children to have a happy and healthy childhood. And this is where they end up living. I don't know if you believe that this is a city, but I think that this very crucial question has a lot to do with urbanity and what we mean when we use the term urban. And once they live there, this is how they spend the rest of their lives trying to go to get to work, to bring the kids to school and so on and so forth. And this is what our cities most of the times look in their inside. So once again, a city that's good for children is good for us all. This is what it looks in new urban quarters in Vienna. This is just another image for that. And this is what it may look after transformation in old historical parts of the city. Uh, and it may give you already a clue of what we did in order to become the world's number one and stay the world's number one. So here's another basic question, and that is, um, yet again, what is a city? What makes a city a city? What is urban? Uh, what makes a city to a place that we love? And there is a quote by Jane Jacobs that has been extremely influential to my thinking. She once said, the outside of the buildings is the inside of the city. Um, and it just changed my perspective entirely about how I went about transforming our city here in Vienna. So my focus on public spaces and their quality has pretty much to do with this quote, um, because it let me understand that the city materializes in public space. It is where we can in, in, we have a chance to encounter each other. It is where we get inspiration and it is where we feel like home or perhaps not like home. Um, so this is how, once again, we should go about transforming our cities. This is just another example of the same street so that you know what it looks like in a normal day and not when there's a festivity. Now, to make a long story short, this is what I believe to be crucial. The three pillars of a good city. It's affordability, it's livability, like I have explained it, and it's community. And we will be looking in a second into this a tiny bit. What you see, as a matter of fact, in this image is also a new urban quarter in Vienna with a bathing lake that was artificially created and on the backdrop actually subsidized so-called social housing units. So managing the transition, how do we get there? Um, now, I think it's about using new urban quarters as an opportunity for improving the already built city and the entire vicinity, as a matter of fact. Um, this is actually what this new urban quarter that you have already seen in the master plan looks like in real life. And... It's about creating new green spaces and connecting them with each other. So what you can here see is always the same principle in our case, high level public transport access, um, very, very low dependency on private car use, ample green spaces that are accessible to everybody and can be used for enjoying life outdoors. Um, just to give you a few examples of what we focus upon when creating new urban quarters. And by the way, at least 50%, if not two thirds subsidized housing there. It's about high density. And once again, a focus on affordable green spaces, open green spaces for everybody uh, with high quality for children. We also introduce collaborative housing that is having um, the tenants, the future tenants planning their homes uh, themselves, which is actually an innovative uh, way to, 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 that we are engaging in subsidized housing nowadays in Vienna. 
And it's about introducing spaces, leaving room, giving room for community activities. This is just another example of how community is engaged straight from the beginning in new urban quarters. And of course, it's about involving uh, the people in, in, in co-designing processes. So the Lego here is not actually for the kids, although, although they love it, it's actually for the parents so that they can experiment uh, with mass um, in a physical way um, and not engage in, in, in frontal uh, discussion processes. And then it's about, once again, transforming historical neighborhoods. Um, this means, of course, engaging in a walkability strategy. I believe that a city for life is a, 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 is a highly walkable city. And then what we also did in Vienna was to introduce the cheapest annual public card, uh, public transport annual card uh, that there is actually worldwide. So in Vienna for 365 euro per year, you can go anywhere. Uh, which has been a hit. In the meantime, we have almost 900,000 people owning a, a card for public transport. Uh, and then it's about uh, engaging and embarking in numerous pedestrianizing projects. This is the most prominent one. This is what uh, our longest shopping street, Maria Hilferstrasse, looked like 2010. This is what it looks like today. And it was just the beginning of a process uh, by which we redo streets each and every year of course, engaging uh, the people who had an opportunity on site uh, to give us their ideas uh, about the new design. And this is just an example of one of the most recent projects where another very central street was redesigned into shared space. So we do approximately two to three such projects per year right now throughout the city. Then it's about creating new public and open spaces. This is a hanging terrace over a metro line in Vienna. And then last but not least, it's about supporting community activities, starting with parties and festivities that are organized by the people themselves, um, learning from their own ideas. This was actually a private initiative in a very, very uh, gray street in a dense part of the city um, that inspired us and we created a community grants uh, scheme. And this is just one of the initiatives that resulted out of this. Here's another one. Um, and then last but not least, uh, when talking about how to go about transforming a city, uh, we have created citizen solar power plants where the Viennese have an, an opportunity to invest their savings in solar power plants. Already 30 of these uh, have been created and we keep going. So the takeaways, this is it. You need a strategy. Um, these are the fundamentals, I always say. You need to know where you're heading at. Uh, you need operations. Um, and um, most notably, using all opportunities uh, that may come up. And you need momentum. In our case in Vienna, I think it was the fall of the Iron Curtain and Austria's um, entering uh, the European Union back in the mid nineties. Uh, today, the momentum for cities are calls, grants, and the vision uh, worldwide uh, of the Paris Agreement to become climate neutral. And thank you. Thank you very much. I think, I think it's so powerful to hear about these, these transformations from, from the people behind them. So, so thanks, for, thanks very much for laying that out. <laughs> you're, you're, you're very well known for your role in turning Vienna into one of the most livable cities in the world, as you, as you just outlined. Um, was livability and this sort of search for quality of life your main ambition? And all projects kind of led into this one aim? Or were you, were you um, tackling different if, issues with different projects? Well, I have... I have to be honest, I think that the, the, the leading idea, the leading notion in my case was to create a city that's good for children. Mm. Um, and this was my vision. I asked myself uh, straight at the beginning, what is it that makes a city livable? And I took this as a leading, as a guiding principle, and then actually started on the one hand creating projects uh, that lead to this. On the other hand, uh, using each and every opportunity, like, you know, in a city, numerous projects just come up 
pop up more or less by themselves. And what you have to do is to actually uh, ask yourself, are they designed in the proper way? Do they leave, lead in the direction that I want them to lead to? So use the opportunities. And then last but not least, um, and that was in the last five years to, to encourage um, ideas uh, that come up by the people themselves. And I have to be honest that the, the, the moment where I said, aha, this is how you actually can create widespread transformation is when you actually um, address communities and give them the support that they need so that they can implement their own ideas. That's such an important point. I think that you 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 managed to implement such huge change um, by working with people. And I think there's a real lesson in there for, for other cities. I think, and, and to me as well, a, a huge part of making a city which is a joy to live in is, is mobility, as you, as you touched on. Um, mobility influences everything uh, from the air we breathe to the vitality of city centres, the number of trees and seats we can put on streets. What was your vision of uh, modern mobility for Vienna? Um, and how did you go about making such positive change towards this modern mobility, um, importantly, in such a short period of time? The most interesting thing about Vienna is that it already had such an excellent, dense um, public transport system. So all we had to do was to make it cheaper so that we make it more attractive and combine it with parking space management, um, which we expanded to the suburbs and which overnight actually meant that uh, commuting to Vienna became unattractive, commuting by car, of course. So we gained all this space and we used this space to actually redesign streets and make them more attractive for walking and cycling. Because I think that the most important thing that we have to realize about our cities is that space is a limited addition and that mobility actually is interconnected to how much space we have and for what. So in the end, the lesson from Vienna is take space away from cars, give it to cyclists, give it to for, give it to pedestrians for walking, give it to public transport to accelerate it, and this is the way to go about it. Thanks. I think it's, it's a it's a hugely important point. The idea that we have to use the space that we do have in cities to to yield the greatest return for society and the city and individuals. I think it's that sort of recognize the importance and the value of the space we have is, is key and a, and a really good lesson from Vienna. I think something else that really struck me about Vienna, um, and you've touched upon it in your opening remarks, is sort of housing. Um, and it's clearly such an enormous part of the story. And what specifically were your strategies for the, for the city? And what has Vienna done to ensure that people have access to this affordable, sociable um, and attractive housing um, and, and places to live in the city centre? Well, what Vienna does um, is, uh, is, in the end, a matter of numbers. We create approximately 7,000 subsidised units per year. Uh, and we already have a housing stock, a social housing stock of all together, most probably, if I count everything together, the different types of social housing, are approximately 500,000 units. Um, so this is a lot. Um, and it means that um, it is not a subsidy for the poor people, to put it in simple words, it's a middle class subsidy. And this is what it should be. It should be uh, one of the best ways for young families to start in a new life. And it should be affordable and it should be available um, in, you know, in order to cover the demand. Um, and if it does so, it then actually also helps, um, well, let's say steer price development also in the free market housing. So this is actually, uh, let's say, the big secret of Vienna's success. Um, and I would also like to stress that it is not only about the price, it's also about the quality. So subsidized housing in Vienna means balconies, it means swimming pools on the rooftop, uh, it means excellent views, it means vast green spaces in front of your door, um, traffic calming, good air quality and high level public transport access. And if you have all these things, plus uh, an affordable rent, um, I think the answer is very, very simple. You decide to stay in the cities, in the city and to raise your kids there. Um, and this is what it is all about. 
it's, it's a really really important remark about about the importance of quality. I think it's something something that um, cities around the world struggle with, and I think there's a, there's a shining example in Vienna of the of a, just the level of um, of sort of ambition in terms of housing quality that, um, that is delivered, which is really quite special. Um, so, some sort of I suppose well, what do I want to say? Sort of culture, relaxation, energy, and fun—all sort of words which I've uh, associated with my time in Vienna. And I've had some really very enjoyable days walking around Vienna um, because in part the streets are, are full of life. There's arts, cafes, pedestrians, cyclists, skateboarders, people watching other people, uh, street performers, and just naming a few. Um, what lessons do you have for other cities that want to make themselves a more inclusive, more relaxed and more fun place for people to live? Well, I would say lesson number one is space, provide space. And in some cases, even allocate space for these types of uses. Because you may have central parts of town that are, well, in non-COVID times, um, overwhelmed, let's put it this way, but tourism and the mass of people using them each and every day. Um, so you may have conflict there. Um, and it is a good idea to allocate space once again for different types of uses and also for cultural uses because you need them uh, in order to create a lively city. Um, and I would say the second lesson is um, support communities to develop and implement their own ideas. And the third lesson is look into your legal instruments. Because it's not only a, about police um, not chasing after young artists, which you may actually encounter also in some parts of Europe. It is also about even providing um, template contracts that can be used by everybody uh, in order to allow for using public space without having to pay for this. Uh, and with having all types of legal issues like responsibilities settled, which is also very important because what you have seen in, in my presentation was, for instance, these small parklets that are created by the people themselves. Of course, we had to create, we had to create you know, uh, a prototype product, uh, contract yeah. um, in order to allow for this. So these things just don't fall down from, from, you know, from the sky. You really have to want them and you have to work at it. That's some great takeaways. It's been, it's been great to hear about all, all, sort of all, all that the city has achieved and, and how quickly you managed to make positive change as well. I think from, from my perspective, uh, uh, sort of focusing very much on sort of transport and streets, I think we really have to see mobility as a servant to quality of life in cities and use it to benefit the people and the city as a whole. And that's exactly what Vienna has uh, done so well under your leadership. Um, of course, if you don't treat mobility as a servant to quality of life, um, as is the case in lots of cities, then um, mobility proliferates essentially to threaten quality of life. Um, so we get the sort of reduced air quality, increased loneliness, obesity, and, and causing all the other crises that cities experience. So there's really a huge amount to learn from, from, from your story in Vienna, so thank you. Um, and I would love to talk more about this, but I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Um, so I just want to thank you again, Maria, and encourage everyone to read uh, more about the fantastic transformation of Vienna. Um, I also want to thank everyone who's listening in, of course. Um, hope you've enjoyed this episode of Ideas Based by the Urban Design Group, uh, Urban Naus and me, Christopher Martin. Um, there's more episodes coming your way, so please do get in touch if you have any questions and follow the Ideas Based YouTube channel and sign up to the UDG Urban Update to see more specials. Thank you very much.